there's a common perception that meditation doesn't involve any thinking. You just force the mind to stay alert in the present moment and refuse to get involved in any thoughts at all, and then it'll settle down. That works for some people in some circumstances, but not for everybody. This is why the Buddha gave a lot of directions on how to deal with distracting thoughts. You don't just note them and drop them. That's one way of dealing with them, but there are other ways of dealing with them as well. And so it's important to know how to use your thinking processes as a part of the meditation. One method is the one that John Lee recommends, which is to think about the breath and think about how you think about the breath. He talks about the breath energy throughout the whole body and how the breath can be good for you and the breath can be bad for you, and how to explore the different manifestations of breath energy in the body. In other words, get yourself interested in the breath, interested in how you relate to the energy in the body. And as you explore that, and as you think about it and analyze it and watch it, the mind drops its other interests, its other objects, its other preoccupations. And gets absorbed through the process of analysis. This is one of the bases of success. We monks saw concentration based on analysis. But there are times when the mind refuses to settle down with the breath. It's got other issues. And there are different ways of dealing with them. First, you've got to figure out what they are. If the mind seems restless, what is it restless about? What has it stirred up? Sometimes the, the agenda lies beneath the surface. One way to bring it up into the surface is to refuse to think about whatever the issue is and see what part of the mind complains. So this is important. You've got to think about this. And you can ask it why. And listen to what it has to say, both in terms of the content and in the terms of the tone of voice. And start thinking about the assumptions on which it's based. Again, you have to do some analysis here to disentangle yourself. You might ask yourself, who in your past thought that way, spoke that way, that you picked up, sometimes without questioning. We've got lots of attitudes we picked up from our parents, from our teachers, from our friends, from the media. John Lee talks about the fact that you have germs going through your bloodstream and they're going through your brain. Maybe it's their thoughts. And just the fact that it's their thoughts doesn't mean that you're not responsible for them, i.e. you're not responsible for following them, taking them up and chewing them over. And if you don't like the idea of thinking about the germs in your brain having thoughts, well, it's the same with the, the people in your background. Their thoughts have gotten planted in your brain somehow. And you have to ask, what are the assumptions behind those thoughts? Do you really believe them? And you learn how to look at them from the outside. I had the advantage when I was learning how to meditate in Thailand that when I would sometimes bring some of these issues up with a John Fuang, he'd give me a quizzical look. He had never heard any thinking like that before. And just the fact that he regarded it as quizzical, I regarded these thoughts as natural. 
I began to realize I was a product of my culture, of a particular set of circumstances at a particular time in a particular place. And it's a really good exercise to learn how to question your background, question the ideas that you were brought up with, the assumptions you carry around. Because if they're not questioned, they'll simply sit there and eat away at your mind, get in the way of the practice. Now, it may turn out that after investigating these ideas, you decide that they are useful in certain times and certain places. But not always, and especially not if they're interfering with your meditation. That's one way of dealing with thoughts like that. Another is just simply looking at the mind. If you allow the mind to think in these ways over and over and over again, you're creating ruts in the mind, those ruts that you want. Do you want your mind to keep going back into those ideas again and again and again? And as the ruts get deeper and deeper, it gets harder and harder to get out. This is called looking at the drawbacks of the, that particular thought. And one way of dealing with these thoughts is to actively replace them with the opposite thought. This is what the recollections that the Buddha taught are useful for. In other words, if you're feeling discouraged in your practice, you can think about all the members of the Sangha, members of the Noble Sangha who went through really miserable times in their practice for one reason or another. Either outside hardships or just their own inability to get the mind concentrated. There's a story of one monk who decided he was going to commit suicide by practicing for more than 20 years. And as he said, he hadn't he had even a finger snap worth of concentration. And so he had the razor and everything all ready. And that's when he came to his senses. His mind was ready to settle down. But we haven't gotten suicidal yet in our practice. And and I dare say that we've had more than a few finger snaps worth of concentration. So you can take comfort from the fact that if he could do it, you can do it. There's no need to get discouraged. When outside circumstances are getting difficult, you can, again, think about the Sangha. And the verses in the Taragata are about monks who are caught out in the wilderness and they're sick. They have no doctor, no medicine. So what do they do? They resolve that they're going to develop the factors for awakening, the five strengths, the five faculties four bases of success, and use that as their medicine. Well, there's the one set of verses about the monk who doesn't get any alms. So what are you going to do? So I'm going to go back and I'm going to meditate. So it's cold outside. What are you going to do? So I'm going to use the Four immeasurable meditations. Limitless goodwill, limitless compassion, limitless appreciation, limitless equanimity to warm the heart. These reflections remind you that when things do get difficult, you want to look into the mind and develop its resources so you don't just. Keep obsessing about the difficulties and complaining about how they make it impossible to practice.
I mean, there have been people in the past who had worse situations, but they were able to practice in spite of it. In other words, you learn how to think in ways that are positive. There's a reflection on your generosity, reflection on your virtue, reflection on the fact that you have developed the qualities that make people into devas. That's to remind yourself that you do have worth, that you do have potential in the meditation. So these are some of the ways in which thinking is useful in the meditation. You analyze unskillful thinking and you try to replace it with skillful thinking. And as the Buddha said, once the mind begins to settle down with the skillful thinking, that's when you can bring it back to the breath, bring it back to contemplation of the body, whatever your frame of reference. So you can deepen the concentration. And in John Mahabhava's analogy, this is like, as he says, trying to cut down a tree in the middle of a forest. If the tree were out in an open meadow, there'd be no problem cutting it down. You simply decide which direction you wanted it to go, and you'd cut it so it would fall in that direction. But in the forest, you have to deal with all the branches that are entangled with the branches of the other trees. And you have to cut them first before you can bring the tree down. Which, if you find that your thoughts are entangling you with the world, you've got to learn how to think in ways that help disentangle you. Whether it's seeing the negative side of the thoughts that are pulling you away, or actively replacing those negative thoughts with positive thoughts that incline the mind to see the value of the practice and to really feel the value of the practice. Today I asked several different people about which stories in the Buddha's life they found most inspiring when they reflected on the Buddha in order to gain confidence in the practice, to gain a sense of inspiration. And it was interesting how widely different the stories were. Some were more inspired by the Buddha's physical courage, some were more inspired by his restraint as a teacher. Some were inspired by his psychic powers, his ability to deal with devas, brahmas, mara. I was more inspired by his ability to deal with simple people. There's a great story where an outcast person talks about his life. He was. His job was to gather the, the old wilted flowers at, at shrines and throw them away, one of the lowliest occupations. And one day the Buddha just stands in front of him and walks along and sees the guy stands in front of him. And the guy tries to push his way into the wall behind him to get out of the Buddha's way. And the Buddha even begins to realize that that's not, not the, why the Buddha is standing there. The Buddha wants to teach him. He takes on this outcast. There are lots of ways you can find inspiration in the life of the Buddha. You have to decide which story or which incident you find most inspiring. The same with the Dharma, the same with the Sangha. There's lots there. This is one way in which reading is useful. There's a tendency sometimes to say that reading gets in the way of your meditation. But when you read about good examples, it reminds you that human beings can do this. There are human beings like this. There have been in the past, and there can still be in the present moment. There's a tendency in modern literature to have anti-heroes, people whose virtue lies in their being frank about their weaknesses. Which is a kind of virtue. But for the sake of the practice, it's also used to 
it's also useful to read about people who've done what is difficult. There are friends from the past. It's one of the definitions of true friends, people who can give what is hard to give, do what is hard to do, sacrifice what is hard to sacrifice. They did that for us, not just for us personally, but everybody in the future. There's that great story about Mahagasapa toward the end of his life. The Buddha calls him Mahagasapa and says, Look, you've been living out in the wilderness, living off of meager alms. You don't really need to do this anymore. You're an arahant now. You come and stay near me, live a more comfortable life. Mahagasapa says, No. I've been doing this all along, praising this, and I want to keep this up as an example for the generations that come after. And he did that for us. So think about that when things get difficult. There are people in the past who wanted to encourage us wanted to see us get the same results from the practice that they got. So take heart from that. It's only when you learn how to think skillfully like this that you can get to the mind to a point where it's willing to stop thinking. So remember, not all thinking is bad. Not all fabrication is bad. You have to learn how to fabricate skillfully before you can let go of fabrication. And these are some of the ways you can do it. <laughs>